Thank you Creative Mornings, thank you to all the sponsors and of course to all of you who are probably more ethical um, these days than I am. Um, I was going through the brief um, on the website and clearly as you know this happens in many cities around the world and it had a lot to do with your moral behavior. That's what ethics is supposed to be. You know? and, and when the first line to introduce me on the website said we need more of Pat, you sure? You can't take that back. Um, but after the next 20 minutes or so, I do hope that you find your own definition of it. Um, so you've got the hashtags, you've got the um, uh, Twitter and Facebook account. Um, this is us, so at EcoStiletto is me. Haven't changed that, not quite sure if that's an issue or not. T Purpose B is the purpose business, and uh, we'll get right into it. So I will say that when I started to think about um, what it is that I want to talk about today, I did mention to my husband, who is somewhere in the audience, I've been asked to talk about ethics. And he's like, Essex! Yay! Um, yeah, that's probably not a joke for everyone. Um, it is a scripted uh, reality TV soap opera. For some of us, we might know Jersey Shore a bit better or The Hills. Um, I said, no, I'm going to talk about ethics. Oh, all right then. Um, that was the reaction I got, but it's a very difficult topic. And I guess the challenge is taking it to how we live today and how you apply it today. So we are gonna talk about ethics. Um, I will not talk about moral philosophies and things like that, but I will say that when we start to talk about it, you do have to go back to some definitions. Um, and I don't know how many of us did philosophy or were mandated to do philosophy when we were kids, but when you take it to the real world, it's very difficult to say, I am utilitarian or I follow relativism, because when you speak to your father and you speak to your spouse, all things and all bets are off. There is a sense of hierarchy, there's a sense of ethics, there's a sense of someone else had come before you. Um, but that is, the, those are the sets of moral behaviors. Um, but I think what we want to do today is reflect on what is moral behavior for us. Um, there's a lot of people in the room who are architects and photography, there's a lot of creatives in the room. How many of you work in big companies? Right, most of them are at work still from yesterday's work day. So clearly this is a very kind of nimble, agile, young um, environment. And that's how I'm going to preface the discussion on ethics today. It's for startups, for SMEs, for people who are just trying to get it right from the start. Um, so it comes from a series of thoughts and a series of um, direction as to how you conduct your actions, how you conduct your behavior. Some of us lean towards a certain philosophy, some of us just do it our own way. We'll try and unpack that a little bit. Um, so, before I get started, let's pretend that this is not being recorded. Let's just pretend that you're not gonna find yourselves on YouTube or the, um, the videos on the website tomorrow. How many of you at the office may have once or twice nicked one of these? Come on. <laughs> I can't be the only honest person out here just because I've got a microphone. All right, so then it's paper clips. Sometimes it's a nice Nespresso capsule, just because. Um, and that's fine, I think. Um, that's fine. Paper clips are fine, stickers are fine. Um, I will then say that nicking and kind of picking on things that we feel entitled to is probably one of the very basic sources of ethical dilemma. I know you might be thinking, okay, that's a bit of a stretch, but, but really, that's the starting point. Because when you, I, I've seen this, I've seen the guy from G.O.D. do this, and he kept walking towards um, the laptop. There we go. Um, so sometimes it's post-its. Sometimes it's a tea bag, sometimes it's sugar, sometimes it's templates. 
sometimes it's reports, sometimes you pack your stuff and you take the entire database with you. Um, not saying that any one of you has done that. Um, sometimes it's a mouse, sometimes it's a brolly. The point is, when do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line? And I'm not kind of here being high and mighty. I've got a good counterpart in one of the hotel groups and whilst our titles are often head of sustainability, his title was Global Conscience. I wasn't quite sure how he hovers over people in his business, but that is not the role I'm gonna play onto you today. But I'd like you to think about where it is that you draw the line, because this could very quickly turn into some of the cases. Now, I know it's a little too small for some people at the back of the room, but let's just pause for a minute. Some of the dilemma here, I brought those clients in, I'm taking their files with me. Um, social media fallouts, or things like, I will meet this deadline even if it means cutting a few corners. Or I know that Jay is having a hard time, she's at the tilt, she might have nicked a couple of dollars. Won't tell, because I know that these are hard times. The Institute of the Society of Ethics um, out in the US say that at least 36% of the time, people know that an ethical breach is being made. And we just choose not to say anything. We can't jump up and down and say, no, don't do that. I mean, who's got that kind of ascendancy over others? But it's very difficult to draw the line when it goes from post-its to proprietary stuff at work. A lot of the red, I'm not sure if that's really obvious, but a lot of the red bits here, plagiarism, um, intellectual property, bloggers who get paid to blog and say certain things, these are very real online ethical dilemma that we have today. So now bringing it into context of the space that we work in. And this is why I think we've got the very painful things of structures at work. Do any, does anyone know what that is? Oh, I was kind of hoping you'd think that it was a vegetarian society pinpointing the meat eater and faulting them for Green Monday. Yes, so it's scapegoating. And what, just shout out, what is a scapegoat? Someone who takes the blame. Someone who takes the blame. Yeah, it's the fall guy because it's just better off, it's less risk perceived by someone higher than that guy or girl, obviously. Scapegoating is a mechanism um, to be able to deal with a crisis when there's a question on ethics. And what about that? It's not a football game in SEAA, it is whistleblowing. Um, and whistleblowing is when you report and you try and keep the anonymity of someone who's raising an issue within a structure. That and many others, such as code of ethics, code of conducts, and all the other documents that we have at work, handbooks and guides. The problem with them is they get offered. I don't know how many people again in the room are in big corporates, but you sign them once a year. You probably don't read them, um, or you kind of know anti-corruption and bribery and corporate governance. Yeah, see you again next year. Um, and then you have to sign it again. And then you hear from HR if you don't sign them and you don't submit them. But these are put into place to bring us back to center. Because there is a very difficult line to draw between paper clips and flash drives and templates or between plagiarism and just not knowing how to reference when you write. Um, these structures are put in place, A, to bring us back into center, but B, to help you think about where the company stands. And this is where I'm going to just say, maybe for us, as we are just starting, or some of the companies that you are just setting up, we're all still kind of figuring out how to do this. Let's take a leaf out of the books of the many corporations that have done this before us. Um, I like doing things in threes. And I'm very aware that people don't retain more than that. So I will leave you three things that may or may not have worked for me in the past, but I'm here to share. Um, so how do you do this? How do you get into some kind of moral compass in your organizations? The very first thing I want to start with is there's, we're all here to save the world. We're all here to make money. We're all here to do some good. But really, the only thing that you can control is yourself. Um, at least that you can 100% control. Hopefully, no one has bigger control over yourself than you. Um, so I invite you to reflect. Um, this is as good time as any post-Chinese New Year to 
kind of just reset and reconfigure. Because often the question of ethics is only dealt with when crisis happens, as we mentioned. But the invitation today is to take this with you and maybe it's a good time to just purge and reflect. So look inwards within your individual selves and then later on within the organization. Um, and like I said, there's many of us who are just kickstarting businesses who are on the three or the five or the 10 year mark. It's as good time as any to look at yourself and the way that you interact with your organizations. Um, and here's a starting point that I can offer. Um, there's two very famous people, different timelines, different eras saying exactly the same thing. So when Gandhi says, watch your thoughts, your words, your actions, your habits, because they become your behavior. They become you. So if you're very much used to plastics and extra plastics and in a plastic bag and in a straw, that's just the way you consume things. It's very difficult to change. Um, Steve, uh, Sean Covey, uh, support to the seven habits, the high seven habits on leadership, is a simple statement on we become what we repeatedly do. So if you like skipping breakfast, that's me, um, but loads of coffee, then you become that. That's the kind of person that you are. If you like telling white lies, again, you become that. So resetting is actually a lot harder. Um, but here's, we don't want to go back to start, we want to move forward. There we go. So if you unpack those, I think you begin with your thoughts, and thoughts lead to actions and actions lead to habits, and then it defines your behavior. It's not an end game. You can always come back. I like the analogy of it always takes 21 days to kick a habit or to start a habit. So for those of you who try to quit smoking, 21 day mark, and then you go right back into it. Or um, if you are going on a diet, um, or if you're getting over the girlfriend, whatever it is, a habit, they say, has a has a kind of culminating day. Let's argue that it's 21. But really, once it's there, it's there. If you're brushing your teeth with your right hand, doesn't mean that you can't brush with your left if you're right-handed. But try it, 21 days. I failed, I reset at 18, so I'm gonna go back. Um, but imagine where that could lead you. Once you get to a reflection of your behavior, it's you, and then the person next to you, and then the six-man team or the six-woman team that you have at the office that you've just set up. You really have a place and a real chance to start defining the way you work. So what does that look like? Establishing your organization's moral compass means thinking about your values. We all write them, right? Corporate values. Integrity and honesty and um, common good and things like that. And then you get into a dilemma two years later and you've forgotten all about it. We spend hours writing the brand architecture, the USB of our company. You present to your big clients, you start with the two slides that you're really proud of. We're different because we believe in the shared economy. Um, why do we not take that seriously sometimes? It's, it becomes a token practice. So while you reflect on your own, maybe collectively you could do an exercise of just reflecting as a company or as an organization. And some things that you think about is why are you in business in the first place? And I'm not saying that we're all here to support sustainability. I think we're all here to make money. That is your first social responsibility and that's what we always tell our clients. But a lot of us are also thinking there must be something else other than that. And if you push that thought, um, you start to look at your core values, things that we say are true to your business, reasons for existence. And I'd like to invite that when you reflect on your behavior, you translate it into one of these. Whether you're writing your core values, you're preparing your brand architecture, um, the savvy way or the garage society way of doing things because there's a different approach. So brand yourselves with that. By branding, I mean just make it, make it a common language within and inside the organization. And then it translates into team dynamics. Um, one of my former employers, not the latest one, but also the one before, we have a lot of things that we do as habits. So morning briefings, for example. And it was, we were in a very client-facing, guest-facing business. And morning briefings usually should take how long? 
if you're meeting with your staff and you're going through the day, how long do you take a morning? Uh, how long does a morning briefing take? Shout out hours, minutes? Too long. 15, 20. Yes, too long. 15, 20. <clears throat> I heard a number. There was a boss that I had who took an hour. And you're going through the day and the revenue and the plans and the crisis and the VIP that was there yesterday. There are also bosses who ran it for 10. I just want to know what is the big thing today. All right, off you go. Can't wait to get to the floor because that's the heart of our business. But because it's become a habit, it's on and on or she goes on and on. Updates, so let me tell you this story and this and then you're all like, oh, let's just get to work. Um, team dynamics, you don't get to that if you didn't believe that you were superior or that there is a need for you to govern. Those were your core values individually and it translates to that. Then you change the general manager and then someone else comes and then he or she says, right, to me, morning briefings, I only do them once a week for 30 minutes, very reasonable. Then the whole organization changes. So this is now a case where your own reflection as an individual could translate an organization. And you might think, yeah, one person can't do it. But if everyone has that evaluation, I'd like to offer that maybe there's a better critical mass that we can look at. Or I was just talking to Juliet this morning about pitching to companies and this whole thing of not responding to your emails. Um, no response to clients. I see a lot of eyes rolling in the front. Um, and that's just the way Hong Kong works. We don't need you right now, but we're not going to say, sorry, Pat, not now. Pitch next year. No, you're not going to hear from them. And somewhere, end of August, you're suddenly going to get an email. Please send a proposal tomorrow. Yes. Remember that proposal you said last August? Yeah, I want it now. Um, that's a dynamic, and that's based on your values. There is no regard for respect or people's time, or people who are perennially late. Of course, those people are not here. You're all very bright and early. But being late is a symptomatic thing. It becomes a habit. And yes, there are many valid reasons that we cannot judge. If you don't have children, and someone is late who has three children, is that ethical to judge them? Maybe not. But being late means you don't respect other people's time. So does going over time, I mean, being there for an hour in the morning briefing. So really think about how your core values translate to your team dynamics. I will emphasize the value of going forward. <laughs> um, there we go. Feedback. Um, one of the joys I had at Shangri-La was to trial, because there was a whole generation of new leaders coming in, and to trial positive feedback. Problem with feedback is we give them, and they're always negative. Constructive criticism. Yeah, they're always negative. Right, didn't do this right, here's a better way to do it. Good feedback is absolutely empowering. It doesn't cost you anything either. You know, someone had a presentation, and you give a kudos. Again, coming from big corporations, feedback is very difficult, let alone good feedback. But we are small, we are nimble. In this room, we're very dynamic, um, I'd like to think. And if you had a good pitch, if you had a pitch that did, maybe didn't go so well, but there's aspects that were very good, cheer that on. Because sometimes business gets so hard, it's those moments that you can count on. So there's a, actually a whole art in good feeding back. And if you're interested in that, I'm happy to share um, some of my learnings in that too. So the very first point is reflect on yourself. Look at your own behavior because it defines your internal culture. And if you invite the rest in your team to do the same, we could look at a very strong internal culture. Did people read this in the news a couple of weeks ago? Right. I'm not here to sell Lego. I'm a huge fan. But I am absolutely <laughs> delighted with a message, which is diversity. I'm not saying people with disabilities. I'm not saying LGBT rights. I'm just saying a difference within the organization. Um, diversity is good because there becomes no one monolithic way of doing things. Debate is good, challenge is good. This is why millennials are labeled the way they are, right? You're, you're agents of change. And it shocks the 50, 60, 70 year old bosses that we have to report to because you want to be <laughs> radical and changing. But diversity is an opinion. It's not just color or race, it's experience. Um, for example, 
So when Musa Tariq left Nike, he's the head honcho on social media and joined Apple, it was actually a shock. I mean, why? What, how, how is he suddenly going to sell gadgets and be really effective? Well, let's look at Nike's history from turning around child labor issues all the way to presenting us with forward-looking products. And that grounds Apple in a way that is more accessible across other markets. And that was also a way of looking at, there's talent that I need, there's skill sets that I need, but I don't need to be hiring from Puma or Adidas because I want someone different. Back in Hong Kong, when you go to HSBC Premier, a lot of the people that look after you, I wouldn't know this, I'm not a Premier member, um, but they come from hospitality, they come from airlines, they come from guest services businesses. They have absolutely no idea about banking, and that's not necessary. They can learn that, but you can't learn the skill of being friendly. You can't take a smile, you can't be, you can't learn being not open. Um, again, back at Shangri-La, one of the things that they did was to look at mixologists. Mixologists and barmen. Um, barmen, for example, have to be engaging, or have to make you damn great cocktails, right? So which one do you get? Do you learn the cocktails or do you learn the, the art of engaging? And this was a huge thing that we kind of talked about and debated because maybe you could just teach how to make six great cocktails, but you can't teach the anticipation of guest need, the joke here, the knowing how to talk sports, but also knowing the latest essential oil. I mean, this is something that really you cross the skill sets and you cross the personalities. This is what diversity means. Um, one of the best practices that Facebook, Accenture, uh, Goldman Sachs, KPMG, last year was a very big about was nixing KPIs, taking away performance reviews, and this was supposed to be really revolutionary. I would take that a next level, and because again, your businesses are small, you might want to look at open councils when there is an issue, rather than the head, the MD, and the board always debating what to do with big cases, throw the issue out to your staff, because you don't have 200 staff anyway that are in six continents. If you have six or 10 or 48, you could throw the issue at them and see how they respond. You will see how the dominant opinion of a moral compass could come out of them. Um, again, this is a lot, there are a lot of examples of how to do this and how to permit it and facilitate it that isn't just HR. I think this is also part of the reason when HR intervenes or when legal intervenes, then that's it. We feel like we're not empowered. So own the process. Um, one of my favorites is Marriott, and the way Marriott does learning about ethics. The last thing a hotel chain might want to prioritize is number one, but when you look at their ethics handbook, it doesn't just say anti-corruption this, this is the lawyer breaking, this is the number of days that you've got to go and serve. It breaks it down to cases that the front office understands. So the concierge is bribed, tickets to X, if he does this. So if you're the staff down in Jakarta and you're reading it, it resonates with you. You want to read more. And I want to give you a different take on that. Here's a video that you can actually use um, if you feel that you want to learn more about the tough issues of ethics. Throughout the years, philosophers have asked, what makes an action good? Suppose you're trying to save the world from aliens who seek to enslave humanity, but you accidentally blow up Earth. Most unpleasant indeed. Or what if you see an infant fall into a pond? You jump in to save it, but a crocodile gets there first. Can your action still be considered morally good? Well, it depends on whom you ask. Immanuel Kant would say that the moral worth of your action is determined entirely by whether or not you are motivated by duty. Whereas English philosopher John Stuart Mill would say the moral worth of your action is determined by the amount of happiness it produces and for the greatest number of people. Kant defines duty as the necessity to act out of respect for the moral law. So, if it is your duty to attempt to save the drowning child but you fail, your action is still morally good. The consequences of that attempt are morally irrelevant. Of course, it's natural to feel happiness from doing your duty, but Kant thinks this doesn't matter. 
Because for him, morality isn't a matter of what makes you happy, it's about rationality. You see, to determine an action's moral worth, you must look to the will of the person who, well, willed the action. Now, the good that the good will wills is expressed by acting from duty, which satisfies what Kant calls the categorical imperative. The categorical imperative is a self-given law, a command that, Kant thinks, our reason dictates to us. Consequently, when we act from duty, we are willing the right thing out of respect for ourselves as rational, law-giving beings. Mill, on the other hand, thinks that happiness, not rationality, is fundamental to morality. And by happiness, Mill means pleasure and the absence of pain. Indeed, Mill thinks that pleasure is the only thing that's inherently valuable. But it should be noted, not all pleasures are equal. Provided that an action promotes happiness, it is morally good. To the extent it does not promote happiness, it is wrong. But what if they're both wrong? What if morality is a delusion, just a sophisticated way of merely asserting one's preference? What if it's all relative? The millennials in the room would absolutely not get that highly unpixelated video. Um, clearly I'm Gen X and I still like Tetris and Super Mario. Um, it's a great video though, um, to start, we love it, but we don't love it that much. Um, great video to start thinking about issues. And videos and learnings in um, ethics will never give you one answer. They shouldn't, but they should allow an inspiration to unpack it. So the second point is diversity and difference in opinion. Encourage that. That strengthens your internal culture. And it leads to your brand. And at the end of the day, this is the one thing that you've got to protect, at least as far as a lot of people in this room are building their brands you're concerned about. Because when ethical dilemma surfaces, when the rubber meets the road, pun intended, this happens. Um, and it's very difficult to recoup what it is that you've lost. What is the, Mandy would know this better, Chris would know this better. It takes ages to build a brand and your reputation, and with social media, less than a second to kill it. Um, it's very difficult to build it back. But the building it back has to go into an absolute restart. You had to go back to your thoughts and your actions and all of that. So in order to avoid that, Let's go back to the offer, the first offer I made, which is to go into a self-reflection. And I've been watching some of the brands and trying to look at the crossover with ethics and sustainability. And really, there's some brands that you will see leadership really drives it. Um, so Air Asia, big crisis, take a minute to read. These are not handled by a social media manager. This is all Tony Fernandez. Contrast that with a way a scapegoating process would go, which Volkswagen is partly supposed to be guilty of and pitting it down to an engineer, oh, I did not know um, that we had problems calculating our carbon emissions, let alone disclosing the right ones. But Tony Fernandez, compassion, number one, being there, number two, physically there, so that he doesn't say anything that his staff does not truly recognize. It's not a PR exercise. PR is the last thing. Uh, promotion, I mean, is the last thing that was in his mind, is to get it right and be with the team. And that is absolutely inspiring. It's not going to bring the crisis to a stage where it is as if it never happened. But you can see how ethics drives leadership, and leadership drives inspiration. Um, so there you have it. Just to recap your thoughts and your actions, turn into your behavior, whether personally, if you want to take this back to your families and your friends, or your organizational behavior. Um, the second thing is think about a diversity of views, whatever the composition of that might be. And lastly, really, to think about your brand. Um, your brand is you. You're selling you. You're selling the concept of the team. 
and hopefully one of these could work for you, if not all three. We're still trying to figure it out. The biggest thing that ties it all together is, of course, the sense of purpose. And hopefully that is something that is strong in you, whatever your value system might be. Um, I think I am hopefully right on time. I will take questions, um, but please don't ask me about cat or utilitarian or something like that. I am not an expert. I can go and phone Dr. Burnett from my team. Thank you very much. We can pass the mic or you can shout out depending on how difficult or far away you are. Um, so when you're talking about, um, you know, in Hong Kong, you get you you pitch out and they ignore you, and then suddenly they want it in 12 hours time. Mm -hmm. How much do you think like a city or a geography's culture impacts that working culture? Oh, definitely. I come from the Philippines, and uh, it is the call center hub if India isn't. And round the clock, you would just go and respond. You want the business? No business. Any business is good business. Um, there might be cultural scenarios where you just don't do that. So if you were in Japan, it has to go through the right hierarchy, devolved and tracked and owned, and that's very much the way that they do things. Is that Hong Kong's culture? I don't know. Um, the locals in the room, you tell me. I think though, culture part, it's how fast Hong Kong moves. And when you're asked, you either are there or you miss the boat completely. So of course you will turn that proposal around and update it. Hopefully you've got the bandwidth to go and do that if you still want that business. Um, and it's just, I think it is the way that we do things here. You know, in other places in the world, it's a slow burn, you know, you gotta get the trust. Once the trust is there, things flow. Um, I can't imagine, I don't know if Europe is necessarily slower than us. It, markets are slower, sure. But the sense of needing to be there at their every beck and call, I think, it's partly a Hong Kong thing. Any more questions? I've puzzled be everyone. Be oh God, <laughs> everyone's gonna be in a reflection mode over the weekend. With the hands at the back. No? Okay. Go on. What about the courage? courage to challenge and the courage to say no, what's your advice on that? When you, in your boots, in your guts, think something is going awry, how do you, how do you challenge that, particularly when you're in a large organisation? Let's face it, you can't, we didn't script that by the way, um, we can't, we can't say one over the other. Um, there was a discussion on, for example, decisions made in companies and then wanting to reverse from that decision. And if you strongly believe against it, say you work for a food company and Hong Kong issue, you realize that this pastry company is using gutter oil and you just don't believe in it. Do you walk away? Do you quit your job? Again, if you go back to a sense of duty, are you able to afford that? Are you able to argue it? Would you be able to work within the system and say, maybe we work towards setting targets to reduce it? Or your job is to put out the information so that it is known. Um, where do I stand? There's, there are certain non-negotiables, and I think this is the invitation. When you reflect on the process, what are your non-negotiables? For some of the architects in the room, working with casinos is not a problem. For some of the architects in the room, working with casinos and gambling is a problem. And it's just one of those things that they've decided. I will never work for a tobacco firm. I will never work for a gaming company, for example. I will never work for palm oil. Um, good luck with that. Because everything now these days at least has some traces of it. But you go back to what are your own core values, your non-negotiables, and hopefully from there, with diversity of views, debate it, discuss it. Sometimes what is so true to you is just not the reality. The reality that we have and the truth that we have in our heads isn't necessarily the truth outside our heads. So let's just make sure that we talk about it. Um, other questions? Everyone wants to get out or everyone has just suddenly sunk in and yikes, this is, I don't know if this is the kind of energy level that you're used to, I'm not, but this is um, definitely a, a, a harder one to unpack, I guess. What, what about um, the financial impact of an unethical company? I mean, it must have a huge financial impact if they 
know, they don't have everything set out like you, you know, lined to do. Yeah. Um, you know, what's your sort of point of view of that or experience of that? Like companies that have done the wrong thing and then the actual financial impact on shares and well, it's reputation. I think if you speak the language of losses, so take Volkswagen for example, it's not a discussion on brand and PR alone, it's losses, it's distrust. Das Alto is no longer your car of preference, for example. For years they enjoy the number one spot. So when you speak to people in the business, so for those of you who work with medium to large companies, you've got to speak the language of the person that you're trying to convince. Talking to my CFO about banning sharks when was absolutely difficult. And it was the, yeah, talk to me next year, Pat. And we did in the next year and the next year. So it took a four year campaign, but we got there in the end. Um, but it is a, here are the losses. This is how long it will take to recoup, like any other business, right? So you need to kind of unpack the losses. But at the same time, how could you deter that from happening again? And this is why in the space of governance and transparency, it's so important to go beyond compliance. Um, compliance keeps you out of jail. Compliance is not cause for celebration. I think people think that if I have my permit and I pay my dues, I'm all right to operate. That's just the minimum that you are expected to do. You come to work, you go to school, that's compliance. But to do more than that is really pushing the barrel. And if I go back to all of your mission statements, you all say preference, best in class, employer choice, right? So none of you are mediocre, none of you are going for just compliance. Other questions? Yeah? I'll give her a shot, okay. Can you scream? Okay. Uh, I'm just curious because Hong Kong is a very small, big city, and you talk about taking post-it notes with you when you leave, but what about taking ethical dilemmas for, from a company with you when you leave, if you make the personal choice to walk out the door and then you're navigating sort of finding your next place or for people that may be interested in going to that company, like mm. how do you, what are your suggestions for sort of word of mouth and how you personally take your ethical perceptions of a company and your experience with you as you go on from that company? Leaving a restaurant and not liking their food and telling people don't ever go there isn't as simple as bad-mouthing your last employer, right? Um, I think I will be treading very carefully because surely that employer, especially if you stayed long, could not have done you all that bad. And again, if you reflect on yourself and your own behavior, you're just not that kind of person. You don't want to burn bridges. You're not the kind of person that does more blabbing and negativity rather than saying the good. Then if someone says, but you know, you've left SCAD, I really want to join SCAD, I'm not going to diss my sponsors now. Um, then you start talking about what's good about SCAD. And then you don't lie by saying it was me, not them. But it's a difference in time as well. Um, I don't think you make it public, you offer it to the public. If you are asked as a consult, you have a duty, especially if it's a friend, a family member and all that. Um, yes, it is a very small space. Hong Kong. So you don't want to burn bridges and earn the ire of people because you never know if you're going to come right back into that company. Um, boomeranging is, is, a, is a real trend. You know, After a few years, then you're a right fit for that company again. So yeah. let's not do that. I think we all deserve more good stories than negative ones. Sorry, one more here. Or is there anyone else before I... I've got a fan. <laughs> um, I was just wondering... In terms of CSR, how gen, gen, generally how genuine do you think it is? Or how many companies put together kind of crappy CSR programs that kind of make them look good but don't really do anything that they don't really invest anything in and, and stuff like that? So we all know that greenwashing is unethical. Um, I don't think I need a lecture on that. but. If I told you that Starbucks donates one billion laptops around the world for kids who need programs in literacy, is that a good thing? Hands up if it's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Is that a strategic thing to your business? Yeah, because it's education. But actually, Starbucks doesn't do that. What is Starbucks business? What is, what is the one thing that they sell? Coffee. So if you go down the line of the business, actually farmers and their children and then getting them out of school. If the 
finishing through school, getting them out of school and then getting them into proper jobs. That's why they've got a Starbucks Academy that looks at high grade coffee, agriculture being modernized so that they can afford for their kids to go to school. There's a difference between CSR for doing good, which is not bad, but strategic CSR in this day and age where it has to be part of your business. And it's a fun, nerdy exercise. If you look at a brand, it's product and services, and then it's CSR program. If it takes you six steps to connect that, it's probably not strategic. Some are more obvious. If H&M looks at cotton, H&M looks at water, it's because 90% of its business is cotton and water. Or if it's Coca-Cola, then it invests in recycling water, then that's because it's part of the business. And that way, you don't go next year and say, I'll cut down the scholarships. Because you can't, because it's part of the business. Um, so yeah, that's how you avoid greenwashing. Any more? Yeah. So there's plenty of companies that do unethical things, but it's completely legal. Mm. Do you feel like we're going to constantly be playing catch up? Or is there anything that we can do to kind of be ahead of that? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, if you are part of industry organizations, I often think that there's so much power to be unlocked with industry organizations because the voice of the industry will push it. Take COP21, and if all energy companies all said, we will commit to X renewable energy and just make that the norm, it will happen. Um, when we ban Sharks Fin, Cathay ban Sharks Fin, Peninsula, and then so on and so forth, but that's less than 1% of the hotel companies. We went to the hotel association, and of course all the three star, four star, two star, no star, are all still serving it. Until that moves, it's not gonna change. And until you engage wholesalers, whose bread and butter for five generations has been that, of course, to them it's an ethical dilemma. What am I going to live on? So you need to kind of go and balance that. Um, we're always, we're never going to live in, I'm supposed to be optimistic, but it's going to be very difficult to live in utopia where there is no ethical problem. But I think you owe it to yourselves to know where you stand because if you flip flop, that's where ethical dilemmas will catch you. And hopefully, you know, we don't get into a situation like that. One more, one more question or no more questions. Does anyone want coffee? Yay! Um, I think we all do. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. If you have questions and wants to know more about the work that you do, how do you contact you? Right here. Um, and I, yeah, I'm happy to pass my details around. It's pat at the purposebusiness.com. Um, and I intend to lurk around Gary now. <laughs> See you next time. Thank you so much, Thank Pat. You. Um, the next event is on the 18th of March, and the theme is change. Um, keep an eye on the website. Make sure you're registered for updates and newsletters and so on. Thank you so much for coming this morning. Please enjoy breakfast, coffee, stay as long as you want, network. Can we stay as long as you want? 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. <laughs> <10 o 'clock. laughs> then you have to get out. Have a great um, day and a great weekend. Thank you very much. Sorry, just one more thing. Um, on behalf of Sarah for General Assembly, there is a talk that we've organized on storytelling. Nothing, well, partly to do with ethics, but it's storytelling and humanizing a lot of the business speak that now confuses a lot of people. So that's when Sarah... 17, yeah, I think here, or yeah, in, in GA's office. So storytelling for business, for non-business, feel free to come. Thank you. Thank you.